Magnesium, you heard me talk about it on my show before. You probably see me on my Instagram talking about it. Why? 50% of us are deficient in magnesium. Well, what's the reason? Well, we know our food is not as nutrient rich and nutrient dense as it was many years ago, but also the advent of all of these processed foods, these fast foods that we're eating are depleting our magnesium in our body. Couple that with being chronically inflamed, chronically stressed, we're over and over reducing the amount of magnesium that we need. Now, magnesium is not being utilized for all these important effects in the body because of lifestyle and nutrition. So magnesium is a top five supplement for me for that reason. And you heard me talk about it in the past, magnesium's important for relaxing the body, helpful for sleep. But today I want to talk about a really important one, athletic performance. And you don't have to be an athlete to take magnesium, right? Moving, exercising, anything that involves everything that I talk about, blood flow, lymphatic flow, magnesium is imperative. Here's why. During exercise, we utilize 10 to 20% more magnesium than we do at rest. Magnesium is involved in the production of energy. Great. We want more energy when we work out, right? It's also involved in moving sugar to the muscles in the brain where you need it the most when you're exercising. What else? It's involved in bronchodilation, meaning that it opens up the lung tissue so you're getting in more oxygen to your blood vessels, right? Improving endothelial function, meaning the cells that line your blood vessels are now working to get more blood into the tissue, more oxygen to the tissue. And of course, it's improving heart function, which is so imperative for optimal exercise performance. So today, I'm gonna to tell you about my favorite magnesium supplement. It's the one by BioOptimizers. You heard me talk about this before. Why? It's a full spectrum supplement, and it doesn't have all the fillers and crap that I talk about. It's pure and it's potent. The supplement's called Magnesium Breakthrough. It's a comprehensive formula. It's got seven different forms of supplemental magnesium. As I mentioned, none of those synthetic additives or preservatives, super potent, the best of the best. All right, so today you're gonna to get 10% off with the special Heal Thyself coupon when you visit biooptimizers.com slash Dr. G and enter DRG10. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S.com forward slash DRG. Use the coupon code when you're prompted, DRG10. Once again, that's biooptimizers.com slash Dr. G and the coupon code is DRG10. Hey, all right, everyone. Welcome to Heal Thyself. Man, another episode. How exciting it is to be here. I want to thank you all for taking your time out. As always, really, the time that you put into this show is reciprocated so much with a lot of love. I'm trying to give you all of the information to make your life healthier, both mentally and emotionally, but we can't forget about the physical, too. All right, so today's show. Now, you heard me talk about stress so much. I even did a whole show on it. But today we're really going to talk about, all right, what is stress? How does it manifest? What are the four root causes of stress? And then what are the some of the solutions to it, right? Because long-term stress is a root, 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 root cause for all diseases, okay? Then we have my guy from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Dr. Will Cole is coming here to talk about all things metabolic health, metabolic balance, blood sugar, metabolic dysfunction, metabolic dis, uh, flexibility. It's going to be a really, really good show because he's just going to teach us what are the major things about eating, timing, the foods we eat that we can optimize. What, what can we do to optimize our overall health? Because that is another root cause to health as, as always. So uh, without further ado, can't wait to talk about stress. It's one of my favorite topics to talk about. So let's get to this knowledge bomb. All right, the stress recovery show. What I'm giving you here is a guide to handling your stress. And again, you heard me talk about stress in the past. I did a whole show dedicated to it. And the reason why is because it's a root cause to all disease. Stress, stress, stress. It is the number one driver of our biological aging. Right? It's what ages our whole physiology. Stress is the gasoline that it just continues the inflammatory fire going and going and going. So how does stress reveal itself? Are you stressed? Do you know? So here are some of the things to look out for. Are you easily overwhelmed every day, especially by tasks that were really mundane at some point, but just getting overwhelming? Are you angry or bothered very easily? How about weight gain? Are you noticing a change in your weight, especially around the waist? Sleep issues, telltale sign, falling asleep, staying asleep. But what about trouble concentrating, brain fog, focus issues? What about cravings? You looking for some carbs, some sugar, some junk food, some alcohol? Sexual health, 
poor libido, you notice all of a sudden, man, I was actually active. I was, I was, I was getting and going and now I have nothing, right? I'm just empty. I'm exhausted. That exhaustion is really indicative of everyday chronic stress. Are you irritated constantly? Restless, agitated, lack of energy, especially dipping in the afternoon. Are you relying on caffeine to really get you going in the morning and in the afternoon? What about aches and pains that are lingering? They're not going away. These are all major signs of stress, chronic stress that you may not be paying attention to you, but really, really dripping into that proverbial bucket that may overflow at some point showing disease, okay? But so not all stress is created equal. We have massive stresses in our world, in our life, right? The death of a spouse, divorce, uh, separation, death of a loved one, major injury, major illness. These are major, major stressors, right? But then we have also less stressful events that can really build up that bucket over time. Uh, stress, the stress is like, oh, okay, we got to plan for a vacation. We've got to plan for a wedding, uh, changing a diet, holidays, changing in social activities, moving to a new place. These are less stressful events, but they can also equally build up over time. But regardless, the mechanism of how stress affects us is the same. We are built to handle stress in short bursts, right? Just think about a gazelle running away from a lion. That's a short burst. If it makes it out alive or a zero makes it out alive, that's a short burst, right? Let's say running away for two minutes, five minutes, and then it catches its breath, comes back, and then it just gets back into parasympathetic mode, okay? There's something called the HPA axis, and I want you to understand what that means. It's a hypothalamic pituitary axis. It's the connection between the brain and the adrenal gland. The adrenal glands above the kidney, they're small little glands, but they are really, really dictating our level of stress with the brain. Two major stress hormones that are released by the adrenal are cortisol and DHEA. They counterbalance each other. I'm gonna go into it a little bit. But also we see epinephrine, norepinephrine. Remember adrenaline, the word adrenaline, that's coming from your adrenals. So how does this work? Well, you see a stressor, you experience a stressor, you know there's immediate danger coming, and your brain signals a trigger. It has a stress response, right? And it can come from emotional stress, it can come from mental stress. What about a drop in blood sugar, spike in blood sugar, inflammation, right? It activates this part of your brain called the hypothalamus. It secretes the hormone to the other part of the brain called the pituitary, and then boom, you get the signal that goes out into your blood. Hits your adrenals, and then once your adrenals get flooded, it's gonna shoot out that stress hormone into your body. What's gonna happen? Heightened awareness, increase in blood pressure, increase in blood sugar, your pulse is going up, your, your immunity is falling down, you're decreasing your immunity, you're decreasing your digestion. The overturn, the breakdown of bone is increasing, so you're getting more calcium in your blood and you're breaking down muscle. So this is a natural response. We have adapted and evolved with this stress response. We need it to run away from that lion, all right? To run away from immediate danger. The problem is imagine this happening at low dose. Imagine all of a sudden increased blood pressure, rapid pulse, right? Your immunity taking a hit, digestion taking a hit, your bones taking a hit. Imagine that every single day over time. Then you get things like high blood pressure, blood sugar dysregulation, prediabetes, diabetes, right? D decreased immunity, right? All of a sudden you're immunocompromised and you're, you're getting more infections. Your digestion is taking a hit because you're not absorbing food. Your osteoporosis, bone is breaking down, muscles breaking down. You see what I'm saying? Over time, these, what are su supposed to be in seemingly acu acute changes in the body and physiology due to stress are happening over time and you're developing disease. So in healthy conditions, we respond to stress and we, re we release DHEA as a buffer. I just mentioned that. Prolonged and overwhelming cortisol is going to imbalance that cortisol to DHEA ratio. Right? You don't want your cortisol high. You want a good amount of DHEA to balance that cortisol. When that ratio is imbalanced, that's a problem, right? Because DHEA is really important. It binds to the brain. It promotes relaxation, decreases pain, helps with insulin sensitivity. You want to be more sensitive to insulin. Maintains tissue strength, repairs the body, boosts that immune function instead of reducing it like cortisol does, and then it promotes a nice sense of well-being. We also have neurotransmitters in the brain and the gut that help balance the epinephrine, norepinephrine, right? Those adrenaline, right? like, oh my God, I gotta run away, I gotta flip a car, you know, I gotta run through a wall. These are serotonin and GABA, and they really help with positive mood and relaxation. So I'm saying all this to say these, where do we start? You have to, you have to first look, am I suffering with symptoms of stress? 
How long have I been suffering with the symptoms of stress? And are they affecting these really important systems in my body? First and foremost, you hear me say all the time, get with a naturopathic doctor, get with a functional doctor. Take a Dutch test, right? And see what, you, what your stress looks like because what you can check is four points throughout the day, how your cortisol is moving, right? You know your cortisol should be high in the morning and start going down throughout, throughout the day into the night. Your cortisol should never be high at night. You can see that on a Dutch test and you can compare it to the high end of normal and low end of normal and you can see where you fall. This is gonna give you really good indication about where you're at in the stage of stress. And here are some of the stages that I wanna talk about. When your HPA axis, hypothalamic pituitary axis, is out of whack, you experience dysfunction basically, okay? The first stage of the dysfunction is the alarm phase. You're gonna have lots of cortisol being released into the body because there is a immediate stress. What are you gonna feel? Wired, restless, irritated, right? At night, your cortisol is gonna be really high. It might even affect your sleep. That goes on unchecked, you're gonna get into stage two. This is when there's cortisol dominance. That's when there's ongoing acute adrenal dysfunction, right? Over and over, mild stress, but no recuperation. You're not taking the time to heal your body. And this is when we start seeing DHEA drop down. Cortisol is being dominant in the body. Now, stage three, that's when you're getting exhaustion. Hypocortisol, not stage one is hyper, too much cortisol. Now you're gonna see you're not even, your, your adrenal glands are so exhausted, they're not even producing enough cortisol. This is over years, you're gonna see fatigue, severe insomnia, mood changes, depressions, hormonal changes in the body. You might see your estrogen, your testosterone change, pain, increased inflammation. You're gonna see a dip in your DHEA. And you might find it's even difficult to complete tasks. So start getting an idea of where you fall into this because unfortunately, most Americans and the way we live here are in stage two or three, unfortunately. So this is, why I, this is why I've done shows on meditation. This is why I've done shows on breath work. This is why I talk about it so much. This is why I did a show on rituals because these are ways to check your stress every single day and it's, and it's a non-negotiable. You have to check your stress. So what are the four major key stressors in the human body? Blood sugar control, hypoglycemia. Are you feeling symptoms of hypoglycemia? Dizziness, shaking, brain fog between or after meals. Are you missing or delaying meals? Are you craving carbs? Are you craving sugar? Do you have increases in blood sugar? Pre-diabetes, diabetes, are you craving alcohol, craving caffeine? Blood sugar dysfunction is a major indicator and stressor in the body of what's going on, okay? Mental, emotional stress, another key stressor in the body. Anxiety, depression, mood swings, right? Are you seeing that it's affecting your overall health? Are you inundated with every single day mental, emotional stress, and what are you doing to check that? What's another one? Insomnia, sleep issues. Do you have issues falling asleep, staying asleep? Are you not sleeping enough? Are you not sleeping deep enough? Are you doing shift work? Another major cause, a major stressor in the human body, and the last one is gonna be inflammation. Do you find that you are suffering from an inflammatory disease? Is your body talking to you by manifesting headaches, muscle pain, back pain, joint pain, digestive issues like IBS or inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's, skin diseases, eczema, psoriasis, asthma, bronchitis, allergies, autoimmune disease, immuno dysfunction. You want to make sure that these things start getting into check because it's sort of showing your body, you, that your body's really going through an inflammatory response. So blood sugar control, mental emotional stress, insomnia, sleep issues, and inflammation. These are the key stressors to the body. Now I'm going to go by each category and I'm going to tell you how to improve them. All right. So blood sugar, blood sugar and balance. So, so important. We're going to have Dr. Will Cole in a little bit talk about what, uh, what imbalances in blood sugar do to the body and how fasting may come in and play a role. But what I want to talk about is simple hacks to balance your blood sugar. Do the fast, okay? But then when you break it, make sure when you eat your first meal, it's nutrient dense, nutrient rich. It has all the macros, good fat, good protein, good carbohydrates, right? And you want to make sure you're staying away from those refined or simple carbohydrates, those simple sugars, that's gonna be a real problem at spiking your blood sugar. You want protein-rich, fiber-rich meals. These are two of the major keys that are gonna help balance your blood sugar. I speak a lot about, about prebiotics for a reason. 
Prebiotic foods are so, so important at balancing your blood sugar too. And these are things like inulin, arabinogalactans. But then you have things like flaxseed powder, konjac root. You want to stay away from high saturated processed foods like those vegetable oils, canola oil, right? Safflower oil, sunflower oil. You don't want any of this, especially ones that are really, really processed. You want more healthy fats into your life. Avocados, right? This is like one of my favorite ones that I'm eating, but also things like olive oil. You want to make sure that you're adequately hydrated. That's always going to affect your blood sugar. Exercise and movement, of course, we know that positively affects your blood sugar. Eating lower glycemic foods. If you never heard of glycemic index, check the glycemic index and see what foods in your diet really spike your blood sugar, especially if you're suffering with prediabetes. Now, you want to talk to your doctor about supplements. Some of my favorite ones are alpha-lipoic acid, biotin, chromium, cinnamon bark, gymnema leaf, berberine. These are some of my favorite things at helping balance your blood sugar. But if your blood sugar is out of whack, out of balance, you have blood sugar dysfunction, understand and know that your body is under stress. And this is going to lend towards disease over time. Mental and emotional stressors. This is the second one. This is huge. I always talk about perspective, giving yourself perspective. See, the first step is in seeing and understanding that you are mentally or emotionally stressed, right? And stopping. And first, like seeing the perspective, stopping everything and going, I can reflect on this and I can understand at this point, let me stop that cycle of feeling on autopilot that I'm stressed. And you can do that, right? First, you have to understand what causes the stress. Where do I feel it? What does it feel like? Is it, does it manifest for me as anger? What about anxiety? What about avoidance, hesitancy, depression? When the stress inciting factor happens, where, what do I feel? Where do I feel it in my body? And then this is the stressor. This is how it prolongs. And this is a key moment here. After you have the emotion and feel it somewhere in your body and you have the awareness, the, the part where we go on autopilot and where stress continues in our cycle is we create a story. And we're good at it. We're really good at creating stories. Uh, and we have this narrative that because I missed this deadline, and it may or may not be true, but we, we ruminate over and over and over on this narrative, and that is what continuously causes prolonged stress. So ask yourself, how can I replace that narrative with maybe a story that's a little bit more compassionate to me? And it's a, key, it's a key move because once you change your perspective and you break that narrative and break that story, it's really powerful because all of a sudden you'll see that stress and stressors are there for you, for an experience, for you to ascend, for you to learn. Bring gratitude and surrender to it. The more we resist, persist. That's, that's amazing. I've heard that quote years ago, but it's so, so true. So start simplifying the things in your life also. Start saying no. If you're overstretching yourself, understand this. And it was an amazing quote. I read it the other day. We look to say yes because we want to be seen by other people. We want to be loved by other people. But the fact of the matter is truly saying no when you don't want to do something or be somewhere or eat something or whatever it is, saying no is a very powerful way of honoring yourself. And that's the first way of showing up for yourself. You can't show up for anyone else if you are doing things for everyone else. You have to show up for yourself first, all right? So isolation, find that time to be alone, find that time to reflect. But on the contrast, find the time to be in community. Find the time to be around people who support you. Social support is so important for mental, emotional stress. Get in nature, start doing rituals, journaling, affirmations, gratitude, movement, grounding, being in nature. This is all important stuff. But really, I want you all to understand, stress propagates over time, over and over, because of our narrative, our perspective. The moment we understand that we have the power to change that narrative, we have the power over mental emotional stress. With that said, you might want to talk to your doctor about some of my favorite supplements, 5-HTP, L-theanine, L-taurine, pharmagaba, L-tyrosine, magnesium, 5-MTHF, and inositol. Those are some of my favorite things to use every day for stress, but I got some herbs, and you know I'm, I'm, I'm the herb king. I love herbs. Some of my favorite herbs, adaptogenic herbs, ones that help your adrenals, rhodiola, eleuthero, ashwagandha, right? Things like macuna, things like passionflower, chamomile, schizandra, hops, valerian. These are some amazing herbs that are really helpful at reducing mental emotional stress. What about the sleep perspective? This is the third one, right? The sleep issues, insomnia issues. You want to stay away from that blue light. I mentioned it. We did a whole show with Matthew Maruca talking about how blue light affects your circadian rhythms, but really wake up, get out into nature, put your feet on the ground, stimulate that cortisol awakening response. Ask yourself, 
how much are you sleeping quantity wise and quality wise and what's affecting your sleep are you drinking caffeine past 3 p.m are you drinking alcohol with dinner what's your sleep hygiene like are you on your phone till you lay into bed are you watching tv until you lay into bed the question is is like how much are you being exposed and stimulated or are you winding down about an hour or two before bed think about your lighting in your place think about electronics think about the clocks that you have around one thing i found is for folks is having a list by their bed there's people who lay down in bed and their sleep latency they can't get into they can't fall asleep very quickly because their mind is running one thing i found that's very helpful is writing a list having a, having a little notepad and write down if you have an idea or something you're concerned about write it so it's on there and you can see it the next morning bedroom temperature is really important you want to keep it 65 to 72 have a sound machine earplugs whatever it helps to reduce that noise uh, reduce that light some people have blackout curtains i love them but make sure you're not getting ambient light that's always going to affect your your rhythm Amongst other things also. Uh, pets, keep them outside. They're, they're going to wake you up. I know I've, I've slept uh, on a bed with, with a chihuahua once, and it woke me up through the night, and I said I'm never sleeping on a bed with a dog again. But maybe you love your dog, but put them on the floor. Your sleep comes first. Get a good quality pillow. Get a good quality mattress, non-toxic. Exercise. I have the Aura Ring that I wear, no affiliation, but it shows me what my sleep looks like, and you can compare it day to day. And then how amazing it is to start seeing improvements. Talk to your doctor. Some of my favorite supplements for sleep, 5-HTP, L-theanine, Pharmagaba, uh, magnesium, phosphatidylserine. We have valerian, passionflower, wild jujube. These are really nice for relaxing your body, CBD, relaxing your body and putting you in a place to get a good night's sleep. All right, the last one I'm going to talk about is inflammation. We have to reduce inflammation. There are many inflammatory foods out there. Uh, simple refined carbohydrates, sugar-laden foods, processed oils, all that crap, packaged foods. Think more whole foods. Think more variety. Get away from those common food allergens like dairy, soy, corn, wheat, eggs. Ask your doctor to assess your gut function. Get into your diet some more anti-inflammatory spices, right? These are things we could dress our foods with that are going to be really helpful at reducing inflammation. Ginger, basil, turmeric, rosemary, cloves, thyme, mint, cayenne. Open up that pantry and start getting high quality spices into your food. Increase those omega 3s, right? If you eat fish, cold water fish, if you're vegan or don't eat fish all the time, flax, chia, hemp, sesame, Brussels sprouts, start getting in that variety of omega 3s, those anti inflammatory ones, to offset those high omega 6 foods that we eat. Of course, optimize GI health. If, you're, if your digestive health is a mess, you are going to be inflamed, especially if you have gut permeability. So, you want to optimize, go with a doctor, see that you're, you're digesting food, your pancreatic enzymes look good, your HCL and your stomach looks good, you're absorbing the food, your there's no intestinal permeability, you know, you're going to the bathroom every day. These are really important things to reduce inflammation. Uh, start integrating some raw foods, if, especially if you can tolerate it. Enzyme-rich, living raw foods are really important. Variety of colors fruits and vegetables, rainbow. There's a reason I say it because there's always different vitamin, mineral, antioxidant profiles in there. Get your exercise. We talked about sleep. Get that sleep and address toxins. Address toxins in your food. Really important. Think about uh, th not only your food, but also in the environment to reduce that load. Remember, all those toxins, which you've heard me talk so much about, are going to affect your body over and over and over. What about supplements? One of my favorite anti-inflammatories that are out there are, is turmeric in a supplement form. Uh, I prefer the Mariva form, which is more absorbable uh, because turmeric is not very absorbable in its raw root powder form, although I'm not against using it. Ginger, really helpful, especially the turmeric in raw powder form if you have digestive inflammation. Ginger is amazing. Skull cap, green tea. Why do I talk about matcha all the time? Quercetin, bromelain, amazing stuff. Vitamin D. These are things that you want to start implementing into your health, into your diet. So look, stress is a silent killer and it's been given that name years ago, and it's so true. Stress is under the surface. It's a, little, it's a little Bunsen burner that's just heating up over and over and over until it starts a, a fire, and we see it in the body. And it manifests differently for different people. But we know the four major causes now. And if one of those is off-center, get them back into balance, right? Because now you know that overall, you're protecting your body long-term from that stress. And what stress does... And it's amazing that we have the power to do so many things by just making these changes. So I really hope this knowledge bomb helped. You know, we had Will Cole on the show uh, last year, and, and he kicked down the door, 
flipped this table, proverbial table, and just blew, blew, blew everything out of the way. And it was amazing because like Will is such a like, wealth of knowledge, so passionate, so articulate. So it's always amazing to have him on the interview. So uh, without further ado, why don't we just get to this guest segment? All right, everyone, very special guest, Dr. Will Cole. He's a functional doctor. You might remember, he was here last year. We talked about inflammation. We talked about fasting. We're going to talk about his new book. I can't wait because this guy is a wealth of knowledge. And we just got to get into this interview because I can't wait one more second. Dr. Will Cole. My man. Yeah, there you go. How the heck are you doing? I tried to give you a real, the best introduction yeah, I can. I, I need you as my hype man like every day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For us seeing patients. Yeah. Yeah. I Dr. Got, G. I got, you know, while you're seeing patients, I'm in the back with a microphone. You're like, <laughs> Will, you got this, man. You know inflammation, bro. Just CRP. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, if only, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks so, for having me. Yeah, man. I, I mean, what we, I really enjoyed our, our last conversation. Mm-hmm. We know a lot of the viewers and listeners enjoyed our last conversation. Now you got this new book. I opened mm-hmm. up the mail. I go, what is this? Is this a book? I didn't even know you sent it. Yeah. It says intuitive fasting. Yeah. I go, what the heck is intuitive fasting? Yeah. And before I even opened it up, you go, hey, can we be on the? Can we do a podcast? Yeah. I go, perfect. We're gonna go into it right now. We're talking about it. First of all, what is intuitive fasting? Because I know you're you're a fasting guru here, but mm-hmm. I really want to know about it. So the book, let me back up a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you know this, but for people that don't know this, my day job, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., I'm consulting patients online. So all of this stuff is a ripple effect of me seeing a lot of cases, seeing labs, and implementing functional medicine in their life. So fasting is a tool that I've used for the past decade in my telehealth center. But... And also, I would say from a writing standpoint, I talked about intermittent fasting in both my books. In Ketotarian, I talked about intermittent fasting because uh, Ketotarian is a mostly plant-based, a clean ketogenic diet, and that mimics a lot of the same benefits of fasting. I guess we could talk about that today. Um, But they both support beta-hydroxybutyrate. But I didn't talk about it at length. And inflammation spectrum, I talked about it because beta-hydroxybutyrate and fasting is an anti-inflammatory tool. So I wanted a deep deep dive into this concept that I've been implementing with patients over the past decade. And it is on the surface, it is paradoxical. I mean, how the heck could fasting ever be intuitive? So I wanted to have a conversation about intermittent fasting and intuitive eating in the same book, um, because I think there's a lot to be said from a functional medicine perspective about these topics. Um, So fasting will not be intuitive when someone's metabolically inflexible. Mm -hmm. When somebody's metabolically rigid, they're stuck in that sugar burning mode. They're hangry. They have fatigue. They have blood sugar problems. They have insatiable cravings. The, all of those things will disguise themselves as intuition. So it's nice and easy to say intuitive eating. I'm a fan of intuitive eating. And there's a certain sect of people that it, that works for them. They have no issues. But a lot of people, statistically, if you look at 50% of the United States having a blood sugar problem, having some sort of insulin resistant, 50 million Americans having autoimmune conditions, and millions more, there's somewhere on that inflammation spectrum. I want to calm the noise and create metabolic flexibility, which is fertile foundation for intuitive eating authentically mm-hmm. and intuitive fasting, because you can go longer without eating because you're more metabolically flexible. So that's the conversation I'm having in the book. Wow, yeah. That, and I love that because... One, I remember seeing a post that you put up recently talking about intuitive eating mm-hmm. and how it can be like all these cravings can be disguised as intuitive eating. Mm-hmm. So you're like, you know, you know, I'm, I want I want a cupcake today, <laughs> right? But is that like really just rooted in that metabolic inflexibility? Yeah. How? Okay. So why are so many of us? I remember when I was in practice, one of my first patients was like a 26 year old girl, and she was pre diabetic, mm. and she was. What, what was seemingly fit, mm-hmm. but, she, but she wasn't. She was like skinny, skinny fat, right? Mm-hmm. But it was interesting to me because I was like, whoa, you're 26. I would have never thought, you know? Mm-hmm. Why are so many of us, why are so many of us suffering with prediabetes, high blood sugar, um, inflammation, and metabolic inflexibility? Man, it's a confluence of factors. It's really a perfect storm. But what researchers are really exploring is this genetic epigenetic mismatch. So researchers estimate that our genes haven't changed in 10,000 years, yet our world has changed very dramatically in a very short period of time when you're putting that into context of the totality of human history. So this evolutionary mismatch is at the heart of a lot of what researchers are looking at is why are we seeing, if our genetics remain relatively unchanged, why are we seeing this epidemic rise of 
metabolic issues, autoimmune conditions, meta, uh, mental health issues, mm -hmm. um, hormonal problems. Well, our genes are living in a brave new world in many ways. So it's the foods that we eat, the foods we're not eating. It's our stress levels. It's our spo exposure to toxins, which you talk so eloquently about. It is trauma. All of these things are this come to a head and trigger that genetic predisposition that has been lying dormant for thousands of years, but are being awoken like never before in human history because of this onslaught of epigenetic stressors. Mm -hmm. So is then the answer to live in a cave with a tribe? Or, <laughs> or, or, or because, I, so no one's gonna do that. Yeah. Because evolutionarily, right, genetically, when we were stable, right, epigenetic mm -hmm. stressors weren't there. Mm -hmm. We were in a community, we were eating whole food, we were sleeping when the sun went down, mm -hmm. you know, rising when the, when the sun comes up. Yeah. How do we start implementing these things so we can be more in line with our mm -hmm. evolutionary genetic stability? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I don't, I think we can really acknowledge and give uh, recognition to the amazing advancements of modernity. There's no reason why we can't harness the best of our modern life, but pivot with some things in our life mm -hmm. to decrease that chasm, decrease that genetic epigenetic mismatch. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to live in a cave. You don't have to, you know, live some paleolithic life. You can live in a modern world. The body is amazingly resilient. And that's what I see day in, day out, is that people just shift their life just a little bit sometimes, and sometimes more significant ways. But even then, when you start feeling great, it's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. It's not this punitive thing. It's like, no, I love feeling so good more yeah. than I miss this thing that made me feel really crappy, you right. know? Right. So it's a no-brainer. When you, when you get someone that light back in their life, like their labs improve, they regain their energy, it is a no-brainer because it's not a punitive, arduous thing. It's just like, no, I love feeling so good. So natural health encourages people yeah. and getting healthy naturally encourages people. So intermittent fasting is one way to decrease that epigenetic genetic mismatch, decreasing that chasm and many other things that I explore in the book. I mean, creating more alignment with our biochemistry in ways that are practical and you can still live your life. You can yeah. still live your modern life. Yeah. And, and I think that that's a big answer to a lot of us because yeah. what I preach so much through media and patients is how do we get back closest to nature, mm -hmm. right? And we have all of these signals that our body yeah. evolve with. Um, but when you put it in a modern society, let's say someone lives on Park Avenue in New York, mm -hmm. they're not going to be grounding in the mornings. You know, it's <laughs> going to be really hard or unless they get to the park. Yeah. But, um, but I love that you can offer these mm -hmm. in your book for, for patients, really important. So intuitive fasting is, mm -hmm. uh, or intuitive eating is mm -hmm. a major movement. I remember the first time I saw a whole intuitive eating page and I was like, what is happening here? Yeah. It, it, first, what is it? Because some people are listening and viewing, they go, well, I don't even know what intuitive eating yeah. is. What is it and and what is the problem? Do you see the problem with it? What's the problem with mm -hmm. it? If it's working for anybody, there's no problem with it. Right. So I, I don't want to shame anybody that they're like, that's how they identify as far as they're eating. They are bringing, because what it is, it's a ripple, it's a rebound effect of all the shame and diet culture. Yes. So I think it's a natural rebound response. And I think some people are just over the shame. They're over the dogma. I'm over it too. Yeah. So I get it. It's it's coming from a layman's standpoint of just good, a mentally healthy, emotionally healthy relationship with food in their body. Go for it. I think it's great. And I'm just saying, coming from a functional medicine perspective, I'm just saying, look, if it works for you, keep doing it. But there are a lot of people where like I said earlier, like we talked about, is it hangriness? Is it intuition? Is it hormone imbalance? Intuition? All these things will be proverbial noise in the body mm -hmm. to, to drown out that still small voice, that resolute voice of your intuition. So what it is, is, I mean, when you hear it on social media, I think a lot of times it can get very nebulous on like, what the heck are they even talking about? Yeah. And especially if you're going through a health problem, your body, your cravings are going to actually lead you to things that are going to make you feel worse in your body. That's not your intuition. So uh, if, if you're eating food and you eat whatever you want, then, and, and you feel good with that, great. But there are a lot of people that it actually will make them feel worse. Mm -hmm. And that's not their, their intuition. So what I'm saying is let's get some semblance. We don't even have to be all the way there. Let's get some semblance of metabolic flexibility. And intuitive fasting is one way to do that. Mm -hmm. At that point, you ground yourself with proper signaling pathways with hormones and neurotransmitters and blood sugar balance. And at that point, you will be able to 
eat more intuitively, you'll be able to know this food makes me feel great. I want to eat more of what I'm, what my body feels great on. And these foods don't make me feel good. I don't want to do it. So again, it's this free will. We can eat whatever we want. People can eat whatever they want. There's no shame in that. It's like, no, I want a paradigm shift to say, no, I want to... It's not that I can't have those things. I can have whatever I want. But I love feeling great more than I miss those foods that make me feel really lousy. So that's what it is. It's food peace is what I talk about in the book. It's having this deep peace about your body and food. And it's not about dieting or shame or or dogma. It's about just wanting to feel good and integrating feeling great in your life. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Because I'm thinking about how many people get clouded on what they're really craving or what their body wants, right? Mm-hmm. They go, oh, my body's craving this. How is it when a person is going through a metabolic inflexibility state? Mm-hmm. What happens that their body is craving food that may not be good for them? Yeah. Well, their body's in this sugar-burning mode, and we're all born, for people to know this, like when we're born, babies are all producing ketones for n- proper neural development. We all are born in a state of ketosis, And we are metabolically flexible as babies. We're burning sugar and burning fat. We've lost that birthright as we age because of modernity, because of this chasm of genetics and epigenetics. We are very much uh, metabolically inflexible. So metabolic inflexibility is like kindling on the fire. It's going to create some light, but you need to put kindling on all day long. Mm -hmm. So why people are craving things is because they need some kindling. If they're missing that next kindling fix, the next sugar fix, or carbs that break down into sugar, they are going to feel really bad. Their light's going to go out. They're going to feel hangry. They're going to bite your head off and they, they don't feel good. That is the antithesis of intuition. That's the antithesis of food peace or any good relationship with food or your body. So that's not fun. And what I'm saying is there's a time and place for kindling on the fire. There's no shame with carbohydrates, but let's use it to our advantage Let's eat more in alignment with our biochemistry so we can still feel great and enjoy these clean carbohydrates, but we have metabolic flexibility, which is like burning that log on the fire or being fat adapted or keto adapted. And fasting does that. A ketogenic diet does that as well. And there's a time and place for both a log or fat on the fire and a sugar or kindling on the fire too. Mm -hmm. So we talk about clean carb cycling in the book. And so people can know how to leverage these things instead of being super tribal and saying like, carbohydrates all the way or like keto all the way. Well, the truth is oftentimes somewhere in the middle. And it's how do we leverage both of these worlds to have a work for us? Mm -hmm. And I love that you're bringing balance into that, especially all the dogmatism that we see. Yeah. Very interesting uh, aspect is when someone is metabolically inflexible, right? Mm -hmm. Right, They're just sugar burning, sugar burning. And oh my God, I need like a cupcake really quick. Mm -hmm. How off, How long does it take often for people to start balancing that? Mm. How long, maybe on average, I know you see a lot of patients. What are yeah. you seeing? Because someone listening, they go, all right, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a carb burner. I'm a sugar burner, but I want to be more metabolically flexible. Yeah. But how long does that take? Is it overnight or is it a year? Yeah. Well, it depends on their baseline. I mean, where are they coming in? I know from a clinical standpoint, I'm meeting people all different points of their journey, what their labs look like, their baseline, what they've done in the past. And that's the same with the reader of the book. I started the book out with a quiz that I adapted from questions that I ask patients. So they can take that quiz at the beginning and they can take that quiz after four weeks and kind of reassess themselves subjectively how they're doing. And that's the metabolic flexibility quiz. So how long is it going to take? They're going to start seeing changes. The average person, when they start implementing the tools in the book, they're going to start seeing changes very quickly, but you're building something. So it's like if someone starts, and I use this analogy in the book, it's uh, this proverbial yoga class for your metabolism. If you start yoga and you go one time and you're going to feel like, what the heck, this is new. I, my body's inflexible. I'm not good at stretching. How does the body even move like this? But the more you show up for yourself, you get that, that art and that rhythm and that strength and that flexibility for your body. And in this case, we're doing that with intermittent fasting. And it's these vacillating, ebbing and flowing windows of eating and fasting that starts to train your metabolism to get more flexible. So people are going to see incremental improvements, but look, we're building sustainable health here. This isn't going to be a flash in the pan where you're just like this fad diet. No, I mean, you're literally shifting your metabolism to be more flexible. And the more you're consistent with that, you will build it for a lifetime. This is a really integrating sustainable health for, for people. I love that. So then someone who is in metabolic flexibility, who's built that up, you know, mm-hmm. showed up to their proverbial yoga class. Yeah. 
how, what are they feeling improvements on aside from just being like, oh, I'm not really craving that cupcake anymore. Mm -hmm. What are they seeing benefits on? I would say, yeah, that's a good one. Um, agency over your relationship with food and your body, and you can choose to eat that cupcake or not. And if you, and I would, and I mentioned this in the book too, it's like you can have that cupcake to use that as an example. Um, and you will be able to know, well, like this was worth it. I had it. And you can not shame yourself and move on. Use that cupcake as a mindfulness practice, or you'll eat that after you've got felt so great that you're like, no, this was definitely not worth it. And you'll remember for, for next time. That's authentic intuitive eating. That's mindful eating. That's what, that's what we're doing. But you did that because you built physiological grounded things that you need f to actually know that, mm -hmm. to have the really awareness on what food even, how does food even impact how you feel? Um, so some other benefits beyond food peace is increased energy. I mean, you're becoming more metabolically flexible. Your body is shifting into that log on the fire. It's more sustainable. It's more slow burning. You won't get the ups and downs of that blood sugar roller coaster. Mm -hmm. But this state of ketosis cyclically, you're not always in ketosis, but beta hydroxybutyrate can pass through the blood brain barrier and will and provide the brain clean fuel. So it improves something called BDNF, or, uh, brain drive neurotropic factor, increases mitochondrial biogenesis, it lowers neuroinflammation. It, there's longevity benefits to fasting as well. Uh, I could go on and on. And it resets the gut microbiome. So our gut microbiome, trillions of bacteria, has this sort of circadian rhythm. Certain colonies of bacteria are higher in the morning, some are higher in the evening. So there's studies that show that it can actually reset this wave-like rhythm throughout the day. So people that have immune-mediated inflammatory problems or digestive problems or both, it's a gut reset as well. So all of this stuff that I'm like throwing out at, at people I think could be summarized by Paracelsus. He was the father of, one of the fathers of modern medicine, other than Hippocrates. He was known as the father of toxicology. He called fasting the physician within, which I think just summarizes it more eloquently than what I just blabbered out. It is this inner doctor that repairs and resets and renews and does all this really cool thing because you're in more alignment with our biochemistry. Mm -hmm. So the body wants homeostasis if we allow it. Yeah, absolutely. I felt that one, man. Because you think <laughs> about it, right? Like, evolutionarily, right? Our mm -hmm. access to food was different. Yeah. And, and we were activating this physician within. He or she or it was doing some really powerful work mm -hmm. when we were like, all right, I'm not going to eat today, you know, or I'm going to eat, I'm not going to eat in this window and now I can feast or famine. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so I love that you're reminding us that w what evolutionarily parallel, being parallel with evolution looks mm -hmm. like, what it activates, mm -hmm. knowing that it's multi-systemic too. It's, it's just yeah. amazing. A lot of people are like, well, I fast and you know, it's good for the brain. Yeah. But talking about the circadian rhythms in the gut is so yeah. powerful, you know? Yeah. Like, it's a master modulator of so many things. And people think it's just about weight loss too. And this is a, a, maybe a, a, not to interrupt you, but some people that don't have to lose weight, they'll say, well, fasting's not for me. I don't have any weight to lose. I don't want to get any thinner. Most of my patients, that's where they're at, actually. They, they, ha they have either that skinny, fat, sort of metabolic yeah. issue, or they have autoimmune conditions, and their gut is wrecked, and they're very underweight. So actually, when you're repairing that gut lining, and you are getting your body more metabolically flexible, it actually preserves muscle. You actually build mm -hmm. lean muscle mass, and you absorb foods better. So I see people, actually, that are underweight gain healthy weight, muscle mass as they get healthier. So it's not just about fat loss. Even though that is a goal for many people, it's not a goal for everybody, and it's a modulator, it's a recalibrator of the human body. Yeah, and brain health is so hot right now. Everyone's talking about yeah, like how yeah. do we optimize our brain health, neuroinflammation, gut inflammation. So um, just to know we're empowered to do that and mm -hmm. look how cheap it is. Yeah, right? it's completely like it's just, free. Yeah, so intuitive fasting, that's the book where we're going to see it all in there. Yeah. We're going to learn. I mean, I just got it. So Thanks, my hands buddy. are on. I'm going to, I'm going to be reading it on the weekend. I have, you know, I'm going to open it in the sauna and now I have material for the sauna, bro. <laughs> that's right. I, lo I love that. I love that's that. Right. I think people would be interested to know, how do you fast? You, uh, you sort of went into it a little bit, but mm -hmm. you know, what, what do you do for fasting? Well, I've, this protocol in the book, it's a four week flexible fasting protocol. I do all these on a daily basis. So I cycle through it, but I do it so intuitively. And that's what I want for the reader. So I'll talk about real fast and then I'll talk about what I do. But there's two levels of this. When you have metabolic flexibility, you have, you can hear that, that intuition and know you do a couple cycles of the protocol in the book. You're going to, 
build physiological intuition and metabolic flexibility to know your intuition. You're, but you're also, I teach what I call metaphysical meals in the book so people can use eating and fasting as a mindfulness practice. So you're dealing with the mental, emotional, spiritual relationship with food as well and fasting. And at, all of that comes in convergence to say, I felt better when I did a little bit more of this I, I need to do more of this, a little bit less of this. The protocol will evolve as the person gains rootedness in their body. So the protocol will look different as the person improves their health uh, because we're all different. That's the bio-individuality aspect of, of what we do in functional medicine. So what I do, I, I'm always ebbing and flowing through those fasting windows in the book, but it's not the exact cycle because I don't need to do that anymore. You've built metabolic flexibility. I can wake up one day and have a breakfast when I want to, and then the next day I'm fasting until lunch, and then the next day I'm doing an OMAD mm -hmm. and not eating until dinner. But there's this effortlessness, there's this intuition of just knowing what my body needs, and I show up for myself every day. That's what I want for people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen overnight, certainly, but you're gonna if you show up and are consistent with yourself after one month, two months, three months, depending on where you're at, mm -hmm. you can start to build this for yourself, this food piece. So I'll typically do an 18 hour fast most days. Um, like if I had to say percentage wise what I end up doing, um, but I will do OMAD pretty um, consi consistently as well. And then some days, like typically the weekends, I'll, I'll do like a 12, 12 and I'll have breakfast, lunch and dinner mm -hmm. and eat. I'm eating all day long and then I'm fasting through the night. So it's all right. It doesn't have to be the same thing. It should be variable. Eating window variability and macro variability is really good tools for metabolic flexibility. Man, I'm inspired. I'm inspired to just like really put that into practice because you know I follow my own fasting. Yeah. Um, just from dinner to when I eat in the morning, and I, I make that about like sixteen to eighteen hours sometimes. But you know, like I listen to my body. It's like yeah. okay, now I'm hungry. You know, I get to do my morning stuff, and now I'm hungry. Right. But I'd be interested to improve this metabolic flexibility because we all can. Oh yeah. Right. It's yeah. just, you just keep strengthening it. Like everyone could be better at yoga, right? Or right. do better or just show up for yoga. Yeah. So yeah. I'm so inspired by that, man. Uh, Will, I know, and listen, I know you are a busy guy. You got a big launch event coming up later today. Mm -hmm. So uh, we got, we got to get you there. Uh, one, the book is Intuitive Fasting. It's, is it out? Oh, it's out, man. It's out. We're, it's out. We can find it everywhere. You could get it. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, support independent bookstores. We're really struggling right now. Um, during this time. So yeah, support all the people, but you can get it anywhere. Okay. And you, you're on Instagram. Yeah. You I, put I, up I, so great reels, man. You got, you got the reels going. You're the real king of keep Instagram up the, now. Keep up with the kids, man. I know, I know. But you're doing an awesome job at it. Where do we find you? At, at Dr. Will Cole. Thanks, man. At Dr. Will Cole, drwillcole.com, all the, all the things, right? All right. Everybody look them up, man. And, and go back and listen to the first episode because this is sort of like building on it a little bit. So Yeah, for uh, sure. Yeah, we had awesome, awesome. And you have to teach me how to do Clubhouse. Oh, I will teach you off the air. Yeah, but. we're gonna. Well, yeah, so so look out, everyone, for Will on Clubhouse too. This man, we're gonna be doing some joint Clubhouse. That's right, man. Fire. Let's do it, my brother. All right, thank you, love you. Thank you, man. What an amazing interview. Listen, just like I said at the end of the Knowledge Bomb, Will is a wealth of information. I'm so motivated and enthusiastic about, I can't wait to read that book actually. Um, I'm so enthusiastic about all the information he's given. I really hope that helped you out. Check out his book. Um, I can't wait to really read it and then bring, bring some more information about what I learned, but I'm very much so motivated to get my metabolic health onto the highest level, optimize it. Fasting is amazing stuff. All right. I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you for rating, reviewing, subscribing. Like always, much love to you. I love you all. and I'll see you next week.